What makes a champion? A champion is an expert who can play the game or do the job just a little better than the other fellow. In a tennis match, for example, the champion generally succeeds in putting the ball where he wants it to go, while his opponent makes just a few more errors. The opponent is an expert, too, and practically as good as the champion. Otherwise, he'd never get in the game against the champion. In a match of this sort, the champion may win a set by six love, which makes him appear to be far superior. Actually, however, he may be only a shade better than his opponent on any individual stroke throughout the match. In dive bombing, much the same relation exists between the good dive bomber and the expert. The expert or the champ will get the smallest average error, but every dive bomber can be good enough to hit, and in combat, a hit on the stern of the ship is as good as one in the center. There are only a few who can hit the target with almost every bomb. But Every dive bomber can improve his bombing enough to hit the target a majority of the time. Dive bombing, first developed by the United States Navy many years ago, is now recognized as one of the most accurate and destructive forms of air attack. Any pilot can drop bombs somewhere near the target, but the expert dive bomber knows where his will hit. Any pilot who carefully studies and then applies the principles of dive bombing in their logical order will soon find that his hitting average is climbing up there with the rest of the experts. Dive bombing is simply a matter of flying the airplane smoothly in a dive while making the proper allowances and corrections so that the bomb will hit the target. But in dive bombing, so many things happen so quickly, with so many possible variations, that some repetition and overlapping are necessary to show all the important fundamentals. In this film, we will see a generalization of the fundamentals. And in the films that follow, we'll see the detailed application of principles as they affect different phases of the practice and combat dive. In dive bombing, the airplane is the gun. The bomb is the bullet. There are certain factors which must be considered in dive bombing, just as there are in ordinary shooting. Let's consider them one at a time. Let's assume we're in a stationary airplane over a stationary target with no wind and no air resistance. A bomb is released. As gravity acts upon it, the bomb falls at a constantly increasing rate of speed. During each second it falls, the bomb speed is increased about 32 feet per second until the bomb hits the target. Let's repeat the scene and watch it more closely. The bomb falls 16 feet the first second, approximately 48 feet the second second, 80 feet the third second, and so on until it strikes the earth. Under the conditions we've assumed, the bomb will fall straight down and hit the target. Now, Let's assume that instead of being stationary, the airplane is in horizontal flight. Again, we release the bomb. Gravity still pulls the bomb toward the Earth with the same acceleration as before. But now the bomb has the airplane's forward speed also. 
since two forces, gravity and forward speed, are acting on the bomb at different angles, the bomb has to move in two directions at the same time, down and forward. As the force of gravity accelerates the bomb, it follows a curved path called the trajectory. Because of the curve of the trajectory, it's necessary to release the bomb some distance short of the target in order to score a hit. If gravity and the airplane's motion were the only two forces acting on the bomb, the bomb would always strike the ground directly under the airplane. But the path of the bomb is also affected by a factor known as trail. Trail is caused by air resistance, which slows the motion of the bomb and makes it fall short. These three major factors working together, forward speed, gravity, and air resistance, make it necessary to correct the aim to hit the target in range. So, in horizontal bombing, we must allow for the pull of gravity on the bomb, the speed of the airplane, and the effect of air resistance in finding the proper position for the release of the bomb. If we release too soon, our bombs will undershoot the target. If we release too late, our bombs will overshoot the target. If we release at the right time, we hit the target. So far, we've been considering an airplane in level flight. Now let's put the airplane in a vertical dive over the target and see what happens. The speed of the airplane, the pull of gravity, and air resistance are now working in the same direction. So by aiming the airplane at the target, we have eliminated any need for correcting the range. The bomb will hit where we aim, whether we release early or late. This ability to hit by flying the airplane at the target and releasing the bomb whenever our aim is on is the foundation for dive bombing. You will see later that we can hit where we aim without diving vertically and that a shallower dive is actually better than a vertical dive for practical purposes. To keep the bombs from falling under or over the target, we must be aimed correctly for range, whether in a shallow dive or a steep dive. In dive bombing, we correct the aim in range by pulling or pushing the stick, just as we do in horizontal flight. This raises or lowers the line of flight to the proper point of aim in range. It is harder to correct for range in a shallow dive than in a steep dive because the same error in estimating dive angle makes a larger error in range. On the other hand, it's easy to correct for range in a steep dive because the same amount of error makes a much smaller error in range than in a shallow dive. Furthermore, the same amount of error in estimating our release altitude will cause a greater range error in a shallow dive than in a steep dive. In a shallow dive, the bomb falls much farther from our point of aim than it does in a steep dive. Estimating this range correction introduces an error. We have only the size of the target to help us estimate our corrections. In making large corrections, this leads to error. It is also much harder to estimate the dive angle of a shallow dive correctly so that our expected error is still greater. Let's make a dive on a windless day. If we reach release altitude at a normal dive angle with our line of sight on the target, the bomb will hit the target. 
Gravity causes the bomb to land short of the line of flight. The sight is boresighted, so the line of sight is below the line of flight. If this is done, the bomb will hit our point of aim when we release in a normal dive. If, however, we're diving the airplane toward the target and find that we're too shallow, we must change our line of flight or the bomb will fall short of the target. Of course, on nearing release altitude, we can pull up the nose, raising our line of flight. This corrects our bomb toward the target. But it does not change our vertical angle with respect to the target. As we change the line of flight almost instantly when we pull up the nose. This correction changes the bomb's path because the bomb is affected by the airplane motion which is along the line of flight. The bomb lands far short of our line of flight and the line of sight because of the large effect of gravity in a shallow dive. The range correction is so large that it cannot be estimated accurately. Let's see what happens if we steepen the same dive to the normal dive angle as soon as we see we're too shallow. Now, although the bomb will land on the line of sight, it is far short of the target. As before, we can pull up the nose, raising our line of flight and line of sight over the target to correct for range. But now our vertical angle from the target is even less than before. And our range correction is still larger. We are worse off than we were to begin with. Let's repeat the same dive and try to correct it once more. This time, we'll pull the nose up whenever we see we're too shallow. If we release our bomb with no correction, it would land even further short of both the line of flight and line of sight than it did in our original dive. But by diving shallower, we have raised our line of flight far over the target so that the bomb will land over the target even though it's further short of the line of sight. However, our vertical angle from the target is now correct, and as we near release altitude, we correct our line of flight by pushing the nose over and putting our point of aim on the target. This correction puts us in a normal dive so that the bomb will land on the point of aim. So, if we start a dive incorrectly, we can still release in a normal dive. If we find ourselves in a dive that's too shallow, we should raise the nose, steepening the vertical angle from the target in order to reach release altitude near the normal dive angle. The bomb will land so near the point of aim that range correction is easy to estimate. On the other hand, if we find ourselves in a dive that's too steep, we should push the nose over to correct the vertical angle from the target and again reach release altitude so that when we make our range correction, we are in a normal dive. Now that we've considered the problems of range, let's consider the problem of deflection. We must keep the bomb from falling to either side of the target, as seen by the pilot. We correct for deflection by turning the airplane right or left toward the target, because we must correct the line of flight of the airplane. Assume that the airplane is in a shallow dive. A small amount of turn will correct a large error in deflection. Now let's aim the airplane at the ground in a steep dive. We see that to make even a small correction in deflection, the airplane must be rotated almost 90 degrees.
Turning an airplane in a steep dive is difficult. If we apply much rudder in a steep dive, the airplane skids instead of turning. A skid like this may skid the airplane just enough to point the line of sight directly on the point of aim. Because we can hold the line of sight on the point of aim, we get the false impression that the airplane is diving toward the point of aim. This is an illusion, because even the heaviest skid gives the airplane very little horizontal motion in a dive. Because of this, it's important for us to remember that in a steep dive, we turn the airplane with much more aileron than rudder, like this. We have seen that it's easier to correct for range in a steep dive and for deflection in a shallow dive. We can't do both at the same time. The only thing we can do is compromise and make our dive somewhere between the steep and the shallow dive. Such a compromised dive is called the normal dive, in which we release our bomb in a dive angle of about 65 degrees. The normal dive starts shallow enough so that deflection can be corrected with a relatively small turn. The normal dive angle ends steeply enough so that corrections for range are easily estimated. Experience has shown that a dive near this angle is best for bombing targets when we have to concentrate on both range and deflection. There are some targets, however, such as bridges, on which we can concentrate on one aim factor at the expense of the other. For instance, here we can approach in a shallow dive up or down the bridge and concentrate on correcting deflection. The length of the bridge will allow plenty of margin for normal range error. Or we can approach in a steep dive directly across the bridge and concentrate on correcting range because the length of the bridge will allow plenty of margin for any normal error in deflection. In the previous examples, we assume that the airplane was flying through still air. Actually, still air is the exception rather than the rule. Therefore, in dive bombing, we must make accurate allowances for the drift of the wind. Assume we are in a dive and have an accurate bead on the target in both range and deflection. Now let's add the factor of the wind blowing sidewise on the airplane. This horizontal wind will drift the airplane sidewise during the dive, moving our line of sight off the target. Let's repeat the dive and allow for this drift so our line of sight is on the center of the target at release altitude. When we release the bomb, however, we find that it retains the airplane's sidewise motion just as it does the airplane's forward motion. So the bomb is now falling sidewise, too. Because this sidewise motion will carry the bomb off the target, we'll still fail to hit. Therefore, we must allow for the drift of the airplane before release altitude, plus the drift of the bomb after release in order to make a hit. If the wind with which we're drifting during the dive remains constant, it is the effective wind. If the wind with which we're drifting during the dive varies, the wind drifting us at release altitude is the effective wind, since this is the wind drifting the bomb as it falls. We'll see in a later film that the wind about 500 feet above release altitude is the effective wind. With knowledge of the effective wind, the wind affecting the airplane at release altitude, we'll be able to select our tentative point of aim on a stationary target, far enough upwind from the target to allow for the bomb's drift after release. We must also allow for the drift during the dive. If we fail to allow for this drift, 
we must continually turn to keep on the tentative point of aim. In moderate winds, the turn is so sharp that it becomes difficult. In strong winds, it's impossible. So we select a pushover aiming area far enough up the winds through which we dive to allow for the drift to the tentative point of aim. We push over on that area. As we dive, the moving point of aim travels toward the tentative point of aim. We can easily make small corrections in our dive up to the point of release. So by the time we reach release altitude, we should be aimed in deflection at the tentative point of aim. Just before reaching release altitude, we go to our site and correct our aim in range. This final correction gives us our release point of aim. In the previous examples, we've assumed that the targets have been stationary. In most instances, however, dive bombing targets are moving to get away as fast as they can. Now let's assume that our range, deflection, and wind are all taken care of, but that the target is moving. We drop the bomb and miss because in the few seconds it took for the bomb to fall, the target has moved out of the way. In order to hit a moving target, we must figure out how many feet the target will move forward while the bomb is falling then we must aim that distance ahead of the target center so that the target and the bomb will meet. Let's try again. This time we'll aim ahead of the target. We release the bomb. And bang! We score a direct hit. There's nothing haphazard about dive bombing. After the basic principles are understood, the rest is the practice that makes perfect. Maybe we won't put all the shots down the stack, but we can put them where they count. Let's review the steps to take. First, we identify the target. Then we pick our point of aim and start our approach. We enter the dive, allowing for the drift of the wind and the motion of the target. We make our smaller corrections to get the final point of aim. We release, pull out, and score a hit.